right, good morning, church family. How are y'all? Good, good. Sounds like you're still waking up, which is fine. It's a good place to wake up at. Um, if you're new here, my name is Scott Brooks. I'm the lead pastor. Have the privilege of being on the preaching team. Uh, a few announcements before we jump into the text is one, uh, the connect card is in front of you. Uh, connect card is simply a way that we would love to connect. And so um, if you fill out your name, your email, and, and things of that nature, you can put in the joy box or the welcome desk as you leave. And what you'll do is uh, you'll receive um, emails for newsletters. So if you want to know what's going on in the door church, we'd love to communicate that. And then furthermore, uh, we have men's and women's Bible studies, um, student ministry, all these things. And so just a simple way to connect. If you're not getting that information, uh, we'd love to do that. So fill it out, put in the joy box. Uh, second thing is if you have uh, students, and we, we kind of, the, the, the demographic of students that we're talking about is from 6th grade to 12th grade, is we have Hinge, uh, hinge Night tonight. And so uh, we'd love to have your student come, invite friends. This is a particularly uh, fun and special uh, night because we're going to be playing, it's not wiffle ball, help me out, pickleball. There it was, I was like, that's not wiffle ball, pickleball. Uh, and so they're going to have a little competition. Uh, if you think you can play, uh, I'd love to see that. If you can't, it, we'll teach you how. But um, uh, it should be a really good evening, 7 p.m. That's from 6th to 12th grade for students. Um, and then just one other announcement. So um, at the Door Church, we're, we're, we try to just take the Word of God. So the Bible, we believe, is the Word of God. Uh, and we try to proclaim what it says and teach what it says, which is always about Jesus. So we're unapologetically going just to proclaim Jesus Christ. And then secondly, we want to order the church, design the church how God tells us to. So the door church is not like it's our idea how we think we should do it. Uh, it says in Scripture, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, that we should have elders that lead and oversee the church, and we should have deacons. And deacons, that word deacon is uh, servants of the church. So we came to you uh, about 10 days ago or two weeks ago and showed you some deacons that we're putting forward. If you're new here... Uh, the Door Church is, we have, uh, we're multi-site. What that means is we have one mission to see lives restored with the gospel of God's glory, but there's a campus in Louisville and a campus in, in Argyle. And so we're putting forward these deacons. The two uh, primary deacons that are, are Argyle are, are Raina and Vandell, and we're so grateful for them. Uh, these are men and women above approach that have been called to serve in the kids and student ministry uh, to, to mature students and kids in Christ and uh, to see the gospel go out. So in Acts 6, it Acts 6, it talks about how they install deacons to serve the local body so the pastors can continue to oversee, lead. And we're so grateful for these men and women uh, that God's called to be deacons uh, here um, at, at the church. So we're going to thank God for them. We're going to ask for protection over them. So if you don't mind, bow your head. And we're just going to pray for these uh, new leaders. God, we're so grateful uh, that you sent Jesus, that we can know you through him. Uh, by your spirit. I thank you, God, that you communicate how we should lead. And we thank you for these deacons that are giving their lives to, to serve this local body. I thank you for uh, just their, their mind and heart for, for kids and students. I thank you, God, that, um, man, they just uh, have lived in a way that glorifies you. I pray that you protect their marriage. I pray that you would protect them. I pray that you give them wisdom and insight and strength to lead well. Uh, I thank you, God, for what you're doing. Uh, you build your, your church, and we just want to say thank you. Uh, we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, so if you have your Bible, we're in Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. Um, it's an interesting text, and we're going to give context to it. And so we're going to look at uh, the greater whole of Philippians 2 before we get to 19 through 30 because it helps out uh, with, with the text. And so uh, because... 19 through 30, it's, it's a little strange. It's basically, um, it's basically a, a travel itinerary. You're like, what does that have to do with Scripture, right? It has actually a lot to do. Uh, and so before we look at this travel itinerary of Timothy and Epaphroditus, we'll talk about how, uh, what it serves, all right? Um, as I was preparing, um, you know, I'm a big why person. I'm sure you may be a why person. Everyone, I think, is. Um, and I'm a big maximizing my life person. Like, when I think about what I do, uh, it's very strategic. Like, I want to spend my time, my money, my resources in a strategic way um, that w it, my life wouldn't matter. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to get through life and it's like I just wasted my life. And so this is a great text uh, for you not to get to the end of your life and that like, man, I wasted it. What was I doing? So this is like such a, a gift to be in the Word of God. I say, what are you doing with your life? Don't waste it. Uh, live a life that's, that, that matters, that has gra gravitas to it, that will, will, will have weight. All right, so 
Um, hopefully they'll get you at least to consider listening. Uh, there's two stories that I want to emphasize. So there's one major storyline in all of stories. And what that is, uh, it's, it's when someone of position of power uh, comes near to the low, the hurting, the impoverished, impoverished and uses that to, to serve or to prop up uh, the lowly uh, to, to, to a new status. Uh, and and I'll, I'll give you some examples of this. Every, every story is kind of telling a greater story, if you will. Uh, I, I picked two, Batman. Uh, Batman, if you're a, a man or, or a woman, um, you, you, the minister, I, I like Batman. Like he, he, I get him, and if you watch the Christian Bell Batman, like that's the one I'm always in on, especially that first one. Batman Begins, uh, it ministers me. Because uh, he, here's what happened. Bruce Wayne is a person in position of wealth. Uh, he doesn't have any need. He doesn't lack anything. Yes, the city of Gotham is uh, in, in turmoil. A lot, of, uh, a lot of dark things happen. A lot of impoverished things happen. But it's not touching him. Was well, his mom and dad die in the, in the movie. And um, he goes away. And he, he kind of lives a life of a prisoner. And he ends up living uh, impoverished in the least of these. And then what happens is he goes back into Gotham. And this man of position and power now uses his resources to help the poor, the hurting, the least of, the, the least of these. And he's kind of this uh, vigilante of justice. He cares uh, for the least likely. And when I watch Batman, I think if, if you have anything in you, are like, I want to be like that. Because it's, it, it, move, it moves me as I watch it. Um, it's, a, it's a very stirring um, movie because you're like, man, he's, look what he's doing with his life. Cinderella is the other one. So uh, maybe men or women like that one as well. Cinderella tells this same story. Like, how is that, Scott? Well, Cinderella is this, this, um, this, this, this you know, you know Cinderella, if you live under the sun. But she is, she's a forgotten uh, daughter, the this, this stepmother, and she's seen and abused and poor, and no one sees her. Uh, and through this magical experience, Prince Charming comes after her and lifts her out of her abuse, out of her lowly estate, and, 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 it, and creates a new story. And all, this story is moving, especially if you've seen the one uh, that, that's not cartoon, but in person that came out like 10, 15 years ago. I don't know. I'm getting older and older. But, man, I was watching the movie, and I cried because it's just that stirring that Prince Charming comes and, 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 and saves her and, and picks her up out of the, 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 the mire, so to speak. Everyone's looking for a people's champion. Right? Does that make sense? We're all looking for that person, a position, this power that stoops low and comes near. Why? Because that tells the gospel story. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, came near, born. And he came because he sees you, he cares about you, he died for you, and he raised you, raises you up to know him. He, we're looking for someone that is going to see, our, uh, see us in our sin, in our hurting, in our pain. We were looking for someone to come. And this is what chapter 2 of Philippians is all about. And so the first thing I want to look at is Jesus. He, he has come for us. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news that God became man and he came for sinners like me and you and he died for us to lift us up to a new position, a new power that we have in him. So let's pick up, uh, we're going to get this, this high position in verse 5 and 6. You see that Jesus, uh, it says, have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God. So this is saying that Jesus was in the form of God. This word form is the same substance of God. The way it's saying here is that Jesus is God. That's what it's stating, that Jesus is God. He's the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. Everything that you have seen, will see, is created by him and it's made for him. There's no greater power, there's no greater position that Jesus is God. He's the author. Jesus is an authority. Why? Because he's the author. It says that Jesus is God. But what did he do? Uh, th this is his high position, uh, that he, but he, he, he stooped, he descended. He, he condescended. What does it say? He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't hold on, uh, but he, he stooped down. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. So what this means is he did not become, he, Jesus never ceased to be God, but God became man. He added to his divinity humanity. This is, this is the incarnation, God becoming man. Just so you know, this is God may low. This is why we celebrate Christmas. Every year we put a tree in our house, put lights outside. Why? Because we're saying God became man and he dwelt among us. This is an amazing truth that God drew near to us. He came for us. He is that 
Prince Charming, if you will. He is the vigilante. He is he's the one who cares, who gave up his power and position, and he moved into, into our neighborhood. You want to know, if you want to know someone cares for you, they draw near to you. God cares for you. How do I know? He came for you and me. He sees us stuck. He sees us as, uh, he sees our lowly estate, but he, he, he came near. Now, verse uh, 9 and 10, not only did, did he... Uh, th- did he come? It says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point to death, point of death, even death uh, on the cross. Jesus died for our sins. He 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 t- he he paid the penalty, his life for our life. And it says, therefore, God has highly exalted him. So God became man, he dwelt among us. What did he do? He died our death. He was obedient to death on a cross, a criminal's cross, a sinner's cross. Then it says, God, the Father, highly exalted and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should, what, bow in the heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue, what, should, what is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What does that mean? That Jesus Christ is the king. This is the gospel. God became man. He dwelt among us. He lived the life that we couldn't live. He died the death that we deserved. He died a criminal's death, a sinner's death. And God the Father raised him from the grave. And when you put your faith in him, you're forgiven of your sins. He he brings you out of your lowly estate. And now, although you die, if you have faith in Christ, you will live. You will raise from the grave just as Jesus rose from the grave. I don't know if you're hearing what I'm saying, but Jesus rose from the grave. There's resurrection after the life if your faith is in Jesus Christ. Although, de- although you will die, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And you will live if your faith is in him. And it says, that is a name above every name. No other name can save you. No other name can forgive you. There is no other name that has authority over sin to forgive you. There is no other name that says, man, death is subservient to me. Isn't that amazing? This is the name of Jesus Christ, and he, he is what? He is our Lord. He is our King. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's just Philippians uh, 1, 1 through uh, 10. We're, we're getting there. Now, now what? Why does that matter? Now, a lot of people have probably maybe heard that. So I was in England, and I just told, uh, I got to do a little kid, uh, kid's holiday camp, and one, one little kid heard that Jesus died, and he has authority over death. He's like, he's like the Grim Reaper. He's like, no, not like that. Uh, he did something. He, he defeated death, and he rose from the grave. He's like, what? He came back to life? Like, so I, I think sometimes we just hear, like, oh, yeah, yeah, he died and rose again. I don't know if you're what I'm saying. That's crazy. And that, that changes everything if it happened, and it did. Now what? What do we do with this? Uh, a lot of us say, I'll say a prayer, I'm going to go do what I want. And that's not what you do. That's not what you do. So I, as a pastor, um, I'm about, I want, I want to see you mature in Christ. I want to compare what Christianity is and it's not. So I think a lot of people hear what I just said. That's the gospel. It, it changes everything. And what we do is like we say a prayer and we go live our life how we want. And that's called licentiousness. And that's not the gospel. It's called cheap grace. I get to say a prayer. I'm going to go do what I want. That's, that's not it. Jesus, if you confess, he's your king. You're not the king anymore, right? That's when you come to Jesus, you're not the king anymore. Legalism, which is full in the south and in our own hearts, right? It, it, is, it, it is this. Legalism is like, I don't need you, Jesus. You can help me out a little bit, but I got the rest of my life alone. That's not the gospel either, right? So when you come to Christ, it's com- professing that he is Savior and Lord, and now he's your king. Now, verse 12, it tells us what we do with the gospel, We don't move away from it, is my point. We go deeper into it. We behold more of Christ. First of all, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only uh, as in my presence, but much more in my absent. Listen, listen, work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. It didn't say work for your salvation. Why? Why do we not work for our salvation? Because that's what Jesus did. He has accomplished what we cannot. So when it says work out your salvation, it says that we should mull on, we should think on, we should behold our salvation. Who accomplished our salvation? This is like Sunday school answer. Who accomplished our salvation? All right, I'm, I'm not really asking. Like, who, who did it? Jesus, right? So he's, what he's telling, he's like, work out thinking on what Jesus has done. 
Think about Jesus. That's what he's telling us to do. We need to behold more and more of Jesus. Work it out means I need to think about it. God became man. He dwelt among us. What does that mean? That he loves me, that he's near. He died my death. I am forgiven. There's no more guilt. There's no more shame. He rose from the day, uh, the grave. I shouldn't have to fear death anymore. I should live for him. Like He says, think about Jesus. That's what he's telling you to do. Work it out. Don't just move on with your life. If you, you, you never graduate away from Jesus. Does that make sense? You go deeper into who he is and what he's done. Now, uh, that's what we're doing. He says, work it out. This is what we're doing right now. Um, we'll go to verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or uh, disputing. Now, um, this is an issue that we all have. And again, I just got back from a mission trip from England. It was incredible. I'm going to share more about it here in a second. They have a fun word about grumbling. Instead, when someone kind of getting grumpy, they don't say grumpy or grumbling. They say he's kind of getting the ump. And, and, and so what I liked about that is the guy, preacher last week was telling me, he's like, you know, it's kind of getting ump. And I'm like, what does that mean? Uh, what it's saying here is don't, don't be grumpy, right? Don't be grumpy. Don't complain. Now, here, here, here's, here's something that's an issue. I, I want you to think about your life and how often you complain. Like legitimately, I complain about your work, complain about your, your kids, your spouse, your finances, p politics. I mean, I'm, I, everyone, I, I can't tell you how many times I'm getting into that conversation. We're just complainers. And I'm telling you this is sin because you, you think God's getting it wrong. You're complaining because you think God's getting it wrong. I'm going to tell you God's in control and he's good. And I'm going to tell you something, he doesn't get it wrong. So when you're complaining, it is it is. The ump. It, it, we're complaining, and we're supposed to be not complainers, but what? Proclaimers of his goodness. Uh, now, when I, again, was in England, I'm going to keep coming back to this because it just ministered to me so much. There's a guy that ministered to me on a soul level. His name was Tim. It is Tim, and he'd always make fun of me for how I spoke. And he goes, Scott. And then he'd like, he talked to me. He's an older gentleman, very sarcastic and dry. Loved this man. Only knew him for a little bit. Now, uh, a girl was processing about her job and how her, she was frustrating and she felt out of control. And, and the way that Tim would, he speaks very slowly and he'd listen, he'd go, he'd go, um, mm, he'd go, out of control, out of control. And then he, he said, if you're out of control and God is in control, wouldn't it feel like you're out of control? And what he was saying is like, your out of control life would testify what, that God is in control. So if you ever feel like you're in control, that'd be kind of where you're saying God is not. Does that make sense? He's saying basically, look, don't complain about your life. Why? Because God's in control of your life. And now I'm not saying this. What I'm not saying is this, that you're not having hardship. So don't be confused there. I'm not saying you're not having hard times. You're not having trials. What it's telling you is don't complain about them. Why? Because God is good and he's in control and he's using them. I'll show you why we shouldn't do this and how it's sin. Verse 15, it says, why this, this, this is a crooked and twisted generation. So when we complain, when we complain, why do we do it? Because we think God is getting it wrong and where's our focus? When we complain, where's our focus? It's on ourselves. So... It, so life is about what? Jesus is king. You are not. So when we're complaining, it's, it's like people aren't revolving around me. I'm not getting what I want. It's not about you. We just said that's about Jesus. That's why we don't complain. This is the choice of generation. We make everything about who? Me. So Kate tells me I'm a pick-me boy. Love you, girl. Uh, and what that means is I always want my daughter's attention. I think she's beautiful, and I, I'm just, I'll do anything to get it. And she, she thinks is somewhat annoying. And what that means is I'm always trying too hard to get her attention. Like, pick me, pick me, pick me. She's like, Dad, it's enough. That is the attitude of a sinful, twisted generation. We just want everyone to pay attention to us. And the point is it's not about us. It's about him. And this is why we live our life. That's why we don't complain. Why? Because we proclaim he is good. He's in control. He's working all things together for good. And somehow... This is for my goodness and his glory. And he doesn't waste. He doesn't waste it. So we should be proclaiming his goodness through it. Verse 16, this is kind of getting to what I talked about in the title, don't waste our life. It says, holding fast to the world of life, uh, word of life so that in the day of Christ I may, I may be poor or be proud that I what did not run in vain or labor in vain. 
This keeps me up a little bit, stresses me out a little bit. What I mean by that, can you imagine getting to the end of your life? You ran in vain. You worked in vain. What does that mean? You come up empty. You kind of look back on your lives like, I have nothing to show for it. And I'm, I'm concerned we're so consumed, not living for him but for us, and we're going to come up when we wasted our life. And I tell you that because I care, and I'm telling that to myself. So, uh, again, I'm going to go back to the kids' holiday camp. That's what they say instead of VBS there. Um, they, they play games. They split the, the groups up in two. They play fun games, uh, you know, question games, tag games, whatever games. And then there would always be a winner and a loser, and everyone would be sad or happy depending on if you win or lose. And the guy who was leading it, very funny, he would always say, if you win, you get nothing. So trying to just say, like, this doesn't really matter. Because you, you shouldn't be too devastated if you win or lose. Why? Because if you win, then I'll say, we get nothing, right? And I just want to just implore you to think about that in your life. If you have all the money in the world, at the end of the life, what do you get? Nothing. You get nothing. You win a game. Great. What do you get? Nothing. You get nothing. You get a trophy. A trophy. That's silly. Now, here, I'm as competitive as anyone, but we do it not for a trophy. Amen? Like, I, I need a trophy to say, well, look how valuable I am. If that's it, it will never, it never give you the, the status that you're looking for. It's like, I just want us to think we can gain the world and run in vain and lose our soul. Parents, this, I'm going to have a little side note for you. I'm going to come back to the text. As I was there, because I love to compete slash win. I'm not sure which one it is. I like to say compete when I'm like trying to adjust myself, but I just like to win. All right? Now, as I was over there across the pond trying to tell people about Jesus, it, I felt convicted. I'm going to have about this much time with my kids. And the last thing I'm going to really care about as I leave my house is how fast they are or how many wins they have or whatever it is or even how smart they are. What I'm going to care about is like, God, God, did I use that time to teach them about Jesus? Because that will benefit from when they're out of my house, this life, and the next. And I just, all right, I'm going to come back into the sermon. Just think about it. You're not going to get that time back. You're not going to get it back. All right, let's, let's come back. Now, what he's saying is work out, not work for your salvation. Look at Jesus. Think about the implications. Think about the implications of the gospel, how you spend your life. Do not be grumpy. Be proclaimers of Christ. Don't live for yourself. Live for him so we can maximize our life. Look to Jesus. Behold him. That way we can, um, that way we can use our life well, worthy life. Now, now he gets into 19 through uh, 30. This is the travel itinerary. It seems super goofy that would, Paul would put a travel itinerary in the middle of Philippians. The reason why he does this, he gives us living illustrations of Timothy and Epaphroditus that are living demonstrations of how not to waste your life. It says, here's Jesus, look to Jesus, work for Jesus, look at them, they're doing it, and model your lives after them. These are examples for us to follow. That's why they're in there. Work out the implications of the gospel. So D.A. Carson, who's a theologian, said it this way, much Christian characters is as much caught as taught. So yes, I'm teaching about it, but when you watch and see other people living a life glorifying Christ, you can catch it. You get a glimpse of what it looks like, and that's what he's teaching us. That is, it is picked up by constant association with mature Christians. We're trying to immerse yourself in Christian stories that honor Christ, that live for Jesus. This is why it's actually a good question as you meet an older Christian. Tell me about your life. How did you not waste your life? How do you think you did? Why? These stories will help mature us. All right, so verse 19 to 24 is Timothy, and they'll go to Paphroditus. I'm going to tell you some people about Ayers Monsal Community Church. Uh, which is the church, I got to do a missionary trip. Um, and I say the church, the people of the church uh, that I met in England. So verse, uh, or Timothy, a living illustration of a gospel-infused life that's supposed to give us a vision of how we should live. Verse 19 uh, through 24, it says this. I hope in the Lord, G uh, hope in the Lord Jesus to send what Timothy to you, uh, you soon so that I too may be cheered by the news of you. So Timothy's with Paul. Uh, Paul's in prison. He wants to send Timothy to them. Why? To, to, uh, to cheer them up, to bring them good news, to, to care for them. For I have no one like him. He says, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, 
how uh, as a son with a father, he's like, so Paul's saying he's like my, my spiritual son. If you have kids, you know that's a deep relationship. There's no one more <laughs> that I love than my kids. He's saying he's like my son, but again, he says, I'm going to send him to you soon. So here's my first point. A gospel culture, gospel maturity that we should model is Paul is willing to send his son, his spiritual best. Although he's being comforted and encouraged by him as he's in prison, he's like, I'm going to send him to you. Why? Because he, he cares about the Philippian church. Now, this is called gospel goodbyes. We should raise up our kids, raise up the best in our church, and not make a holy huddle, but we should send them out. Isn't it, wouldn't it be fun just all hang out together forever? These are gospel guys, but Paul is showing, man, a selfless life that he's not only going to look to his needs, but to the church of Philippi. I don't know if Pastor Brad, he's coming back on sabbatical uh, on Monday. He'll be back in the pulpit next week. Praise the Lord. Excited. He was in Louisville for a very long time. Love Pastor Brad. He is like a brother in Christ to me. We've done ministry for a very, very long time. But we didn't keep Brad. We sent him. Why? Because we, we love this area. Now, it's easy to try to keep people, but here's the maturity thing. We raise up people. We send our best out. Does that make sense? Furthermore, verse 20, it's really insightful. Timothy, his character that we should think about, is he, it says that he is generally concerned what for your welfare. He's concerned about the welfare of the Philippian church. He cares deeply about the church. He's thinking about people, like I'm looking at people. He's thinking about how to pray for them, how to serve them, how to meet their needs. Um, this is about Christian maturity. He's not so cared about his finances, he's not so care, concerned about his, you know, what everyone's saying about him. He's concerned with what? Their welfare. We should be very concerned about how we care for one another. Why? Verse 21 says, how we care for the church uh, it says, for they all seek their own interests, not those of what uh, those of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's interest is what? The church. So when we care about the church, are we caring about Jesus' interests? Yes. Jesus came and died for what? The church. And so when we give our life, resources, time, money, what for the church? We're giving our life what? For Jesus. Do you see? He helps us understand what it looks like to live a Christian life. You should give your time, your money, your resources, your life to love on the church of Jesus Christ. He is very concerned with it. So that's Timothy. Epaphroditus, um, I'll go 25 through 30 very quickly. Uh, Epaphroditus is the, another living illustration that is, uh, has proclaimed Christ, is working out his salvation uh, to, to God's good pleasure. All right, so verse 25. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, uh, and your messenger and minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him, not only on him, but also, uh, but me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Uh, I, I, am the, I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice uh, rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So I'm going to stop there. So Epaphroditus, here's what's going on. Epaphroditus is part of the, the Philippians church, and Epaphroditus is coming to Paul's need and aid uh, in, in, in prison, and he's bringing finances that we know from chapter 4. So he is bringing financial help to Paul from Philippi to, to, to him, and he's, Paul is in need. Now, uh, the name Epaphroditus comes from uh, Aphrodite, which is a Greek mythical, mythical goddess. So here's my point. Epaphroditus is not a Jew. Uh, he is a Gentile. He's not living for the Lord. But God, God opened his eyes to the glory of Jesus Christ, that he could be forgiven, that he could be saved, and that Jesus could be his king. So uh, what we see here is Epaphroditus is not living for himself now as a wealthy business guy, but he's living for Jesus. And now he's using his own time, money, and resources to go, man, support Paul and the gospel movement. He's supporting the church of God. This is a normal, average, Joe, everyday Joe. Like, he's living for himself. God saved him. Now, what he is living his life for the gospel, his resources to strengthen the church. Uh, Paul's description of him here was super beautiful. He's my brother. If you're in Jesus Christ, what that means is you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You become a child of God, not because of your name, but because of him. He gives you a new status. You're a son of God. Not only saved to him, but you're saved into a church family, brothers and sisters of Christ. Don't assume you're in the church family. That's, assuming doesn't get you. Faith gets you there in Jesus Christ. There's a new identity, a brother and sister in Christ, and there's deep affection. He goes on to say he's a fellow worker. So everyone is working for themselves, amen. 
That's what we do. We're great at it. Everyone works so hard. Everyone does it. But who do you work for? Yourselves. When you meet Jesus, you quit working for you and work for him. He's a fellow worker. We're co-laborers, not for ourselves, but for Jesus. That's what he says about Epaphroditus. He's not working for himself. He's working for Jesus' name now. A fellow co-laborer, fellow worker. And he goes, a soldier. Man, I like battle illustrations. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I like him. He's a soldier. He, he understands there's a spiritual battle going on. So much of us are abusing our lives to win little stupid games when there's a real game that's going to have implications forever, right? There's an eternal rate of return. He's now giving his life. He's giving his life because he understands there's a spiritual battle that's real. People, don't know, people that don't know Jesus are going to be separated from God forever. He says, I want to give my life not to live by myself, but for Jesus so they can know him. And what's cool about that is that God doesn't waste our life, and people, we can be part of people knowing Jesus as we live for him. So what's crazy here is we are talking about Epaphroditus thousands of years later. Isn't that crazy? Because he's living his life for Christ. You know, you don't know what your life will mean as you live for him. Let God take care of that. Does that make sense? Like Epaphroditus did not waste his life. Look at the, the weight here that it's still ministering, what, to churches all over the world. Man, give your life to Christ. Spend your life for Christ, and God will maximize it. So I'm going to tell you about my travel itinerary. I went to Ayers Monsell Community Church. I don't have enough time. I have more notes than I could actually share. So I'm going to pick a few. What was the most impactful about the thing uh, about going to England was actually not Big Ben, and it wasn't uh, the kids' camp, although that was awesome. It was meeting the people of the church, people that were living their life on fire for Jesus. Uh, Wesi. Wesi was born in a country uh, in Africa. Wesi, I'm sorry, I can't remember what, what, what country, if you're listening. She went to Dubai, was trained and sent over to England, and she is a lawyer. She's a very intelligent young lady who is 25 years old, and she's working pro bono for people that are low income and have no money. She could be making money for herself. She's making a name for herself, but she's giving her life for the least of these and building up this local church. It is so God glorifying and she is a beautiful gift to God. And it encouraged me greatly to see someone living for Jesus. Tim and Judy, Tim and Judy. Man, Tim, I love that man. He, he is a very wealthy man. He did not tell me that, you just know, all right? He, he is very successful in business and he's retired. And he's not on the beach wasting his life. He, he is living in a, in a lower area. And him and his wife, Judy, is helping um, Somali refugees, caring for the least of these women that have been abused and neglected. There's not one Christian in the community. Tim works for her, below her and is te teaching English to these, these refugees that are coming in. He could be anywhere in the world he probably wants. But he's choosing to live his last, last life there, investing in the kingdom of God. Um, I, 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 Andy, Andy was the best storyteller I've ever been around my life. And so Andy is a church planner uh, in Ukraine. He knows Russian fluently. Tanya was not there. She was just there, but she is on the front lines of the battle that's going on between Russia and Ukraine right now. And she is bringing money to people that are hurting. She's pe putting people pe in, in, she's like 20 miles from the battleground, putting people in her basement, leading people to Christ that have never been open to Christ. And she's there. Why Andy's in England. Why? Because it's too dangerous for Andy to be there. Because men are just being taken. So Tanya is literally risking her life to build the church. And Andy, I'm like, I was like, that's so convinced. Like, I don't know if I let Marcy go near there. It, it was extraordinary. Now, we get very drawn to dramatic and extraordinary things about God. And these are people, and maybe God calls you to those things, but it's everyday ordinary that matters. One theologian said it this way, and I think it's, we need to hear it. It says, to give my life for Christ appears glorious. To pour myself out for others, to pay the ultimate price of martyrdom, I'll do it. You know, some are like, I don't know if I'll do that. But some of us, like, we kind of, we kind of glamorize it. I'm ready, Lord, to go out in a blaze of glory. We think giving our all to the Lord is like taking a $1,000 bill and laying it on the table. Here's my life, Lord. I'm giving it all. But the reality for most of us is that 
he sends us to the bank and has us cash in the $1,000 for quarters. And we go through life putting out 25 cents here, 50 cents there. Listen to the neighborhood kids' trouble instead of saying, get out of here. Going to the committee meeting, give a cup of water to a shaky old man in a nursing home. Usually giving our life to Christ isn't glorious. It's done. And all those little acts of love, 25 cents at a time. It'd be easy to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder to live the Christian life by little by little over the long haul. This is why at the Door Church, we say we're other people focused. We want to live, we want to live for Christ in the everyday ordinary. Your neighbor needs to know Jesus. The people at your work need to know Jesus. I'm not calling you out of there unless God is. But he's saying live for Jesus there. Live for him. It's having, it's having conversation with the lowly, the abused. It, it is inviting someone for dinner. It is babysitting a single parent mom. It's praying with a friend in need. It's giving someone help that needs help. It's helping someone move. It's visiting someone in the hospital. It's asking a barista how they are doing. It's the everyday order that's God glorifying. Don't waste your life. See, now, I'm going to show you something. The re- I, 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 I'm going to say something. Uh, I, I think we're pretty confused here just in the states and particularly the south and just the church. And what I mean by that is uh, we think that Jesus, we just add Jesus to our life and we get to do what we want. And I'm going to tell you, if that's what you think, you, you haven't become a Christian. That's not the call. It's not, it, it's, a, it's a worthy life. And, and Jesus earns it for you, but it's something different than that. So I'll tell you what I mean. So Epaphroditus is goes down to visit Paul. He gets sick. He says it twice. He almost dies. God heals him, which he can do. God has mercy on the sick and can heal this life or the other. But listen to what it says. It says, for he nearly died. This is verse 30. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life, risking his life to complete what was lacking in, the, in your service to me. What he says is this. Epaphroditus, going to visit Paul, knew he, what, he was risking his life. It wasn't something he didn't know. Like he, Paul's in prison. Paul ends up getting killed. He was willing to risk his life for Jesus. The call to Christianity is to lose your life, to gain it. Do you understand that? This is what it says, to live as Christ dies, what gain? So I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll give you Andy and Tanya again. So Tanya was uh, born in the U- Ukraine, He's right on that Russian border. He showed me where his at. legit, right next to Russia. The USSR, which Cold War, the KGB. What was happening during the Cold War, Russia was getting rid of all Christian literature, all Bibles, and they used to hide their Bible in, in the beehive. They'd wrap it in parchment paper, hide in the beehive so they could have a Bible to read the Word of God. Isn't that convicting? How many times we walk past all the Bibles in our room? Anyway, they're hiding their Bible at the risk of their life, and they're getting rid of all the literature so people can know Jesus. Now, there's a, a, a traveling... Uh, pastor and sh- uh, strategist to ki- keep the gospel going forth in Russia. Uh, and he came, he's like, we need people to help us have printing presses. We have four printing presses in Russia, and they had them in different locations. Not one pastor knew where all of them were. Why? Because they'd come to the pastor and would kill their family to give up the printing presses so that no one could have all the knowledge. And he's like, I need, we need more people to help. I need two people or one or, one or two people to step up to go to these printing presses. What they do is they take newspapers of Russian newspaper, cut out the letters, and they form letters of Scripture on the page, take pictures, and that's how they make Bibles. And she, he's like, we need people to do this. And Tanya just felt like God was talking to her. She was 19 or 20 at the time. Uh, and she went home and prayed all night. God, is this what you call me to do? Is this what you call me to do? And she came out this morning. She went to talk to the guy, and she says, I feel like this is what God's calling me to do. He's like, as I was talking and asking, I felt like God was telling me you're going to be the one. And he said this to her. He said, hey, I, w- I need you to know if you go, there's a great risk that you will die. And what she said is crazy. She goes, I died last night as I was praying. What she's saying is I was willing to die. I'm already dead. But to live is Christ. To die is gain. See, Christianity is not adding Jesus to your life. It is dying to yourself. Deny yourself, and you receive Christ. It's a great trade. It's a great trade. To deny yourself, get Jesus, and life eternal is a worthy trade. But it's not an addition. It's a death to self. If you d- to know that you know, this is what it said here, but it says in Scripture to take up your cross and follow me. I think we make Christianity something else. It's a denial and death of self to receive the word of life. Do you hear what I'm saying? Galatians 2.20 says it this way, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me 
and gave himself up for me. The call is to die, but as you die to yourself, you get Christ and you live. Let's pray. God, I pray that you'd help us see these great, great testimonies of Epaphroditus, of Timothy, of Paul, to live as Christ has gained. It's a great trade. The trade is to die to self and come alive in Jesus Christ. To say, I'm not the king, but Jesus is king. Is to live a life that is in submission and in service to Jesus. God, as we die, we actually find life. But as we try to hold on to life, we actually die. God, you're so kind to us to say, actually die the death that you're going to die anyway. Why? So we could have life. Help us see that. Magnify the beauty and glory of Christ this morning. That he willingly died for us, so we will always live. Help us. Help us die and gain that life. I ask that in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.